Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, being here. Not gone yet, Wendell. Uh, before I take your questions, uh, let me uh, note that just two, uh, two weeks ago, the President led a week-long effort to highlight this administration's focus on attracting job-creating investment to America. At a time when our businesses have created 9.2 million new jobs in just over four years, and more companies are considering bringing jobs here, it has been a top priority for this administration to do all we can to help businesses invest in the U.S. and to support good jobs for American workers. In doing so, we can create more jobs and faster economic growth as more companies from around the world are choosing to bring job-creating investment to the U.S. And today, we have even more reason to keep our foot on the accelerator when it comes to attracting investment. A new study shows that we are leading the world. For the second year in a row, an A.T. Kearney survey of 300 global executives found that the U.S. was ranked the top destination in the world for foreign direct investment. Last year, the U.S. surged past Ch Brazil, China, and India to retake the top spot for the first time since 2001. This year, the U.S. extended its lead, scoring one of the highest confidence scores on record for any country in the survey's history, and ranked first by respondents from every uh, geography and in every industry. Not only did the U.S. extend its lead, but the improvements over the past two years have been profound, and the U.S. continues to show greater positive, positive momentum than any other country. And that's why, as the President departs for Europe, tomorrow members of his team will be hosting a business roundtable with companies in Warsaw that have recently announced their own investments in the United States or are gearing up for future business here. I expect we'll have more details for you on this roundtable soon. Together, taken together, U.S. and foreign companies are investing billions of dollars that strengthen our economy, directly support thousands of high-quality jobs for millions of U.S. workers. Uh, and today's survey shows once again that the rest of the world overwhelmingly wants to make it in America. Jim Cunin. Thank you, Jay. I uh, wanted to ask you about uh, Bo Bergdahl. Um, what made the administration determination that, that you that it was these particular five detainees in Guantanamo that should be released in exchange for Mr. Uh, Sergeant Bergdahl's release. Uh, just earlier today, Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough said that uh, members of Congress or the required members of Congress have been notified over, uh, I believe he said, uh, for years that uh, about this effort and that it included the potential transfer of five Gitmo detainees. <coughs> I'm also curious what the reaction was from those members of Congress when they were presented with that possibility. The point that the Chief of Staff is making is that uh, we have been engaged in an effort for years, as we should have been, uh, to recover Sergeant Bergdahl, a prisoner of war in Afghanistan. And uh, as part of those efforts, there have been ongoing discussions uh, about how to bring that about, and that included uh, conversations with members of Congress about uh, at least the possibility of transferring these five detainees uh, as part of getting Sergeant Bergdahl back to the United States and back with his family. As we've been saying, uh, since we successfully uh, recovered Sergeant Bergdahl this weekend, uh, this was the right thing to do because we in the United States do not leave our men and women in uniform behind uh, during an armed conflict. And five years is a very long time to be a prisoner. We are enormously gratified that uh, Bo Bergdahl uh, is now safely in U.S. Uh, hands and uh, is getting the uh, health uh, care that he needs and has begun the process of reintegrating uh, that will take some time, no doubt, given the duration of his uh, captivity. But it is a, it is a welcome uh, development to be sure when uh, our uh, single prisoner in the Afghanistan conflict has been successfully recovered. But what was the, was there any pushback, was there uh, acknowledgement on the part of these members of Congress when you guys mentioned these particular five detainees? Was there, uh, did, did members of Congress agree with this, uh, this kind of swap? Did they say, no, bad idea? Can you tell me anything? Of, what that kind of discussion was about. I, I don't have a readout of conversations that date back uh, some time. Uh, I think what 
it reflects, however, is that this should not have come as a surprise to members of Congress that this uh, was possible because we had been working to secure Sergeant Bergdahl's release uh, for a long time. And uh, prisoner exchanges in armed conflicts are hardly uh, a new development, including in our history in the United States. Uh, whether it's the Japanese or the North Koreans uh, or others, we have engaged in uh, prisoner exchanges in the past. Uh, we don't, the United States does not, uh, leave uh, our men and women in uniform behind. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Martin Dempsey, said in a statement, quote, it is our ethos that we never leave a fallen comrade. Today we have back in our ranks the only remaining captured soldier from our conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Welcome home, Sergeant Bo Bergdahl. And that's uh, the senior most member of our military speaking. Uh, as you know, there have been detainees who have returned to the battlefield. What are the guarantees, other than just a one-year ban on travel uh, on, these, on these five uh, detainees, that they won't go back and target U.S. interests, U.S. personnel, U.S. military? Mm -hmm. Again, I'll restipulate that prisoner exchanges are uh, not uncommon in armed conflicts. Secondly, I'll say that with a, without getting into specific assurances, uh, I can tell you that uh, they included a travel ban and information sharing on the detainees between our governments, between the United States and Qatar. I can also tell you that the assurances were sufficient to allow the Secretary of Defense, Chuck Hagel, in coordination with the national security team to determine that the threat posed by the detainees to the United States would be sufficiently mitigated and that the transfer was in the U.S. national security interest. Uh, so this uh, was done after the appropriate consideration uh, and analysis, and it was the judgment of the Secretary De of Defense uh, in coordination with the entire national security team that there was sufficient mitigation in place and assurances in place uh, to allow the uh, exchange. One, uh, uh, one quick question on the carbon rule today. Mm -hmm. uh, as proposed by the EPA, it gives states uh, up until 2017 or 2018 to enact some of these uh, uh, rules. Any concern here at the White House that that places an actual implementation uh, beyond this administration <coughs> and in the hands of a, of a subsequent president uh, who could not be friendly to this particular issue? We are focused on doing what we can to ensure that uh, we significantly reduce carbon pollution because of the negative effect that it has on the health of our children uh, and the health of our environment. Uh, this is the right thing to do, and I know you've heard from the uh, EPA administrator and uh, we'll hear from the president on a conference call he's doing later today uh, and heard from him over the weekend in his weekly address on this issue. We have faith that uh, as the years progress, it will become uh, more and more a consensus view in the United States, even here in Washington, uh, that we have to take action to ensure uh, that uh, we protect ourselves here in the United States against the most serious consequences of climate change and global warming. And one of the steps that we need to take and we can take is to reduce our own carbon emissions uh, in order to help tackle that effort, which has to ultimately be an international effort. Uh, we've made significant progress through the actions the President has led on, including the car rule that uh, dramatically increases fuel efficiency standards and will itself reduce significantly carbon emissions here in the United States, will save uh, Americans around the country uh, significantly over the long term in terms of the uh, cost of filling the tank. Uh, and this proposed rule will, when implemented, uh, save Americans on their electricity bill and uh, significantly reduce the amount of carbon emissions in, uh, into uh, our air. Uh, and therefore, and by doing that, rather, uh, reduce the uh, number of uh, cases of asthma uh, and other uh, negative health uh, impacts that carbon pollution causes. Hey, Steve well, Holland. Um, why didn't you give the Congress the 30 days notice on Sergeant, Ber Sergeant Bergdahl? As I think you heard the National Security Advisor say over the weekend, it was the 
judgment of the team and the President that there was uh, enough urgency here to ensure that Sergeant Bergdahl uh, was safely recovered, uh, that a 30-day window of hoping that that opportunity uh, remained open uh, was not uh, an option. And ultimately, as Commander-in-Chief, the President had the responsibility to, uh, to take the action he did to ensure that, as uh, Chairman Dempsey said, our only remaining prisoner of the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan was safely recovered. And what was the urgency that you mentioned specifically? Well, going back to the questions I answered from Jim, this has been an effort uh, that has taken years uh, to bring about uh, recovering Sergeant Bergdahl. And uh, there are no guarantees in situations like this, just as there were not in the past when it seemed possible we might recover him but did not, uh, that something like this uh, would uh, remain an open possibility if uh, we waited any longer. And so when the opportunity presented itself and we could successfully re recover him, we acted quickly to do so. Uh, the moment he was in U.S. custody, w the notifications of members of Congress began. But uh, in this circumstance, as Commander-in-Chief, the President uh, felt it was absolutely the right thing to do to ensure that uh, Sergeant Bergdahl was in U.S. custody. And has it been determined yet whether he was a deserter? The first and foremost thing that we have to recognize here is that Sergeant Bergdahl was in captivity for five years, held against his will. And it was absolutely the right thing to do, consistent with our tradition in the United States, to secure his return. Uh, the Defense Department will obviously, has been and will continue to be the lead in terms of uh, evaluating all of the circumstances surrounding his uh, initial detention and his captivity. And that process continues obviously uh, directly with Sergeant Bergdahl now that he is in U.S. Uh, care. But I would point you again to what Chairman Dempsey said and what Secretary of Defense Sagal said and what so many others have said about uh, the ethos that we here in the United States abide by when it comes to uh, men and women who are taken prisoner during armed conflicts and the history of uh, this government taking actions to secure the return of our POWs is very full. Let me move around a little bit. Sure. Oh, thanks. Does the White House think that the admission cuts announced today are enough to prompt China to sign on to a binding global climate deal? The proposed rule announced today demonstrates U.S. leadership in this important area. I wouldn't predict what specific actions other countries may take, but uh, it stands to reason that leadership by the United States a demonstration of a seriousness of purpose here uh, will have at least potentially positive effects on other nations as collectively we address a global challenge. Um, the fact is that uh, as uh, the President and others have said so often, uh, this creates opportunities uh, to uh, further invest in, in renewables and other areas uh, that will enhance our energy independence and create thousands of jobs here in the United States. Uh, and we ought to aggressively pursue that uh, in the future as we have in the past. Uh, so I think that the opportunity here for the U.S. to lead, uh, to <clears throat> pull carbon pollutants uh, out of our atmosphere so that in our air so that our children are healthier uh, in the future, uh, and to enhance our energy independence moving forward is the right thing to do. Yes, sir. Jay, uh, a couple more things about uh, Sergeant mm -hmm. Bergdahl. Was there a sense here in the administration that <coughs> if the Congress was notified beforehand, uh, members of Congress might put up roadblocks uh, and make it more difficult to release or get the release of Sergeant Bergdahl? I think the issue was simply that there was a near-term opportunity to recover Sergeant Bergdahl and save his life. Uh, and so if we moved as quickly as possible to do that. Uh, the administration determined that uh, given the unique and exigent circumstances, such a transfer should go forward, notwithstanding the notice requirement of the NDAA. Uh, because of the circumstances, because of, as we've discussed, uh, the state of his health, the fact that he'd been held for five years in captivity, the fact that uh, there were no guarantees that the window would remain open 
the window of opportunity to recover him. Uh, it was the right thing to do to move quickly and, and take that opportunity. There have been obviously a lot of questions about the legality of this. Uh, point blank, does the president feel as though on this issue and this kind of issue he's above the law? Absolutely not. To be clear, the 30-day notice requirement has appeared in NDAA bills and in other legislation in this and prior years, and we have repeatedly noted concerns with this requirement. In signing statements, he, has, he the President, uh, has consistently made clear that the executive branch must have the flexibility to act swiftly in conducting negotiations with foreign countries regarding the circumstances of detainee transfers if necessary. Uh, and that was certainly the case here. On the issue of those signing statements, mm -hmm. the President said when he was first running for President that he thought restraint needed to be used uh, with signing statements. Is this an example of presidential restraint? I, I appreciate the way you phrase that question because it's often misreported that he somehow took a position against uh, all signing statements, which was never the case as a senator uh, and candidate. He made clear that there were times when it would be appropriate, uh, but that the uh, authority to issue signing statements uh, should not be uh, overused or abused and that a, a president should exercise restraint. And I think if you look at his record in office, now five and a half years in office, you'll see that restraint demonstrated. Uh, but there will be and have been circumstances when uh, signing sta statements are necessary uh, because of uh, the president's view and the executive branch's view of the constitutional, constitutional issues involved in a particular legislation. And uh, with regard to this specific uh, situation within the NDA bill that was uh, already addressed within a signing statement. And last question. Mm -hmm. uh, has the President put a price on the heads of other Americans uh, because of the way this deal went down? I, I think this goes back to the general proposition uh, that has been true throughout our history as a nation that we, uh, the United States, always seek the return of uh, our prisoners in an armed conflict. And uh, there is uh, a long history of uh, prisoner exchanges in previous uh, armed conflicts. And uh, this action uh, that was taken to recover Sergeant Bergdahl is entirely consistent with this past practice. Sergeant Bergdahl was a prisoner in an armed conflict. Uh, and uh, we did the right thing by, after five years of captivity, uh, securing his release and recovery and return to the United States. The fact of the matter is, uh, as I noted before, if you look through our history, uh, there, are ample, there are ample precedents to this kind uh, of decision uh, because, as Chairman Dempsey said and so many others have said, uh, we don't leave our men and women behind uh, and we don't, uh, we don't qualify a decision about leaving them behind or not leaving them behind based on the uh, uh, on who's holding him. Alexis. Jay, um, how does the President view his role or his leverage to get released aid workers or American journalists, as a, as a follow-up to the last question, uh, as distinct from the options open to him or the compulsion he feels to, mm -hmm. to free military, U.S. military? Well, I think that's a good question, and I think that uh, it is absolutely the case that this administration, not unlike previous administrations, uh, engages aggressively in an effort to recover Americans who are uh, being held uh, against their will um, in other circumstances, and, and that includes uh, Americans being held in Iran or in Cuba or elsewhere. And we, I think it's important to note that as we find relief in Sergeant Bo's uh, recovery, our thoughts and prayers are with uh, those other Americans uh, whose release we continue to pursue and with their friends and family. When it comes to a member of the military who is being held uh, as a prisoner during an armed conflict, there is uh, quite a bit of precedent for uh, the action that we took and, and, and the bottom line that we the United States and the United States military does not walk away and leave behind uh, members who are held prisoner during an armed conflict. Just to follow up on the last question, too, does, is, does the President share the concern that has been voiced by some members of uh, families of, of existing prisoners that their lives may be in enhanced jeopardy because of this? I think it's fair to say that 
Americans in that conflict and elsewhere have uh, put themselves in harm's way on behalf of uh, us and everyone in the United States for quite a long time. And I don't think that uh, the decision to seek uh, in complete consistently, uh, sorry, to seek in complete consistency with our history, the release of a POW, uh, alters that equation at all, uh, any more than it did when we uh, ex engaged in exchanges with uh, the North Koreans or with the Japanese or others in previous conflicts in our history. Okay. Jim. Um, since it appears at least that Sergeant walked away from the base without his weapon, was not involved in an actual combat at the time. Did the National Security Advisor misspeak when she said that he served with honor and distinction? And if she did not misspeak, how did he serve with honor and distinction? Uh, again, you, you're, you're citing uh, a circumstance with a lot of ifs attached to it, I would refer you to the Defense Department in terms of uh, its assessment and review of the circumstances under which Sergeant Bergdahl was initially detained. And I would point you to what the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs said about his successful recovery uh, and its, consistent, its consistency with an ethos that has long been uh, held here in the United States and by our military. Uh, My question is not about whether or not he should have been, there should have been a deal to release him. My question is about the, the words used to describe his service. He was promoted during his captivity, and Susan Rice said he served with honor and distinction. Is that true? And well, how? I would certainly refer you to the Defense Department. You noted his promotion, and, and I think that since this goes to questions about his initial detention, the Defense Department is the body that has been reviewing that and will continue to review it uh, now that uh, Sergeant Bergdahl has been recovered. The fact of the matter is he was held captive by uh, an enemy force uh, in an armed conflict with the United States and our allies for five years and consistent with <coughs> centuries of past practice, uh, we sought, and sought to recover him and successfully recovered him. On the other subject of the EPA, as someone sitting at home, there's a lot of debate today about whether or not how much how much is this going to cost me? What is true? It is, uh, regardless of, of the benefit to society and the benefit to our environment, how much is this going to cost me for, in my home electric bill? Well, I would point you to uh, economic analysis that shows that these standards will, actu will actually shrink electricity bills roughly 8 percent by increasing energy efficiency and reducing demand in the electricity system. Look, throughout our history, Jim, uh, when America has taken steps to cut pollution and protect public health, opponents of those steps have made dire predictions about destroying jobs and harming the economy, and throughout our history they've been wrong. Uh, when we passed the Clear, a uh, Clear Air Act to combat smog, they said new pollution standards would decimate the auto industry. Not true. In 1990, when we took steps to stop acid rain, they claimed the lights would go out and businesses around the country would suffer. But the facts tell a different story. The EPA has been protecting air quality in the United States for more than 40 years. And in that time, we've cut pollution by 70 percent, and the economy has tripled in size. Uh, what that demonstrates is that we can, uh, in a smart way, take steps to reduce the amount of pollution in our air so that our children are healthier and do it in a way that allows our economy not only to continue to grow, but to grow more effectively and, and, and efficient, efficiently, and in the case of the kinds of uh, developments that will be a partial result of this uh, proposed rule, uh, we'll see an increase in investments in uh, areas of renewables and the like that, that will create cutting job, uh, cutting edge jobs in the future here, uh, of the future here in the United States. And we've seen that already uh, as we've uh, made significant increases in uh, renewable energy production here in the United States in the past several years, and we expect to see that in the future. Major. Did the President and his team believe that Bo Bergdahl might be killed by his captors, and that is the exigent circumstance you referred to? Uh, Any time you have a prisoner held uh, against his will for as long as he was, uh, he is by definition at risk. It is also the case I that mean his an health. Acute and immediate risk. Uh, it is also the case that he. Uh, his health wa 
was a concern and uh, justifiably so. I can't get into all the information that we uh, had available to us, but I think you've seen reports now out of Germany that um, he's getting health care uh, for conditions that require hospitalization, uh, and that was a concern. And the, the, the package of concerns, including the opportunity to recover him after five years, uh, and given the past history, the uh, understanding that that opportunity may not uh, present itself uh, indefinitely, the fact that his health was deteriorating, the fact that uh, the circumstances of his captivity were, by definition, uh, threatening, uh, it was the right thing to do to take action to secure his release. Do you disagree with the characterization of the five released detainees as among the hardest of the hard and possibly responsible for the deaths of thousands of people? Well, I, I would simply say that we have a long history in this country, and our allies do as well, of uh, exchanging prisoners uh, in an armed conflict, especially when that armed conflict is coming to an end. As you know, because the President announced it recently, we are bringing our combat mission in Afghanistan to an end. Uh, we have also uh, put forward uh, a plan whereby we would sustain the significantly reduced military presence in Afghanistan after the end of the combat mission to uh, continue to train Afghan forces and uh, maintain a counterterrorism posture there uh, as we wind down to zero uh, in several years. Call easier, and was it nevertheless still a difficult call to release these five? You know, I, I just, I'm not going to get into all the specifics except to say that when it comes to the five individuals that you are referencing, as the Chief of Staff noted earlier, this has been, uh, these five have been identified as uh, potential uh, transferees uh, as part of this uh, release of Sergeant Bergdahl for some time. And uh, it was the assessment of the Secretary of Defense in consultation with the full national security team that there were uh, sufficient mitigation uh, steps taken by Qatar and assurances received by the United States that these detainees do not uh, pose uh, a threat to U.S. national security and that it was therefore in our interest to uh, take action to recover Sergeant Bergdahl. To what degree were those assurances solidified in the <clears throat> when the President talked to the Emir Wednesday at West Point? Uh, well, the the President uh, has had uh, a couple of conversations, uh, I think more specifically a phone call uh, to the Emir, um, and he did have a meeting at West Point, but this was a process, again, that had been ongoing for a long time. So nothing was solidified there that wasn't already understood? I, you know, I don't want to get into too many details about uh, presidential conversations, but, you know, this process was uh, fairly uh, fairly completed by then. One last question. The International Red Cross has expressed some surprise that it was not in any way, shape, or form brought into seeing the transferees before they were moved out of Gitmo, which is something that has been happening with their participation and awareness of before. Can you explain why that was that decision was made? I, I'd have to refer you to the Defense Department. I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, all the questions around that. I. I can simply point you to the general approach we took here, which was to uh, make sure that we were able to recover Sergeant Bergdahl. Once he was uh, safely in U.S. custody, we began notifications to Congress, and the process uh, began to transfer the five detainees. Kristen. Um, Jay, thanks. I want to follow up on the question about Susan Rice's comments about Sergeant Bergdahl serving with honor and distinction. You referred the question to the Defense Department, but she's a White House official, so can you say no, I why I referred the question about Circumstances surrounding his uh, initial uh, detention would you say by that the he Taliban. With honor and distinction? I, I, again, this goes to I, I would I would echo uh, what uh, Chairman Dempsey said. I would echo what uh, National Security Advisor Rice said. I would note what the, Depart the Department of Defense has done with regard uh, to Sergeant Bergdahl, and I would note that the issue of uh, all of the uh, information surrounding his initial. Uh, captivity or detention by the Taliban is something that the Defense Department is reviewing. Uh, but I think that it is uh, absolutely a fact that um, a member of the U.S. military, a uniformed member of the U.S. military, was held captive by uh, an enemy force in an armed conflict uh, and in keeping with uh, a long history in our country, uh, backed by an ethos that says we don't leave our men and women in uniform behind. 
we were able to successfully secure his release. <coughs> Understood, but does the President stand by Susan Rice's comments that he served with honor and distinction? The President stands by, stands by actions that he took as Commander-in-Chief to secure the release of the only uh, member of the U.S. military held as a POW uh, from either the Iraq or Afghanistan wars. It was absolutely the right thing to do. So you're not going to weigh in? I think I've said uh, three times now that uh, you know, we all stand by what the Defense Department has said, what Chairman Dempsey said, and what all the members of the national security team have said. I want to go back to the assurances that you got from the Qatari government. It's my understanding that those assurances last for a year. So what happens after that year, Jay? What do you say to the American people? What's protecting <coughs> national security interests beyond that year? What I can tell you is that uh, without getting into too many specifics about the mitigation that comes with uh, this transfer, that uh, there is a travel ban that is associated with it, there is monitoring uh, that is associated with it, and that uh, altogether the Secretary of Defense and the National Security Team concluded that uh, there was enough uh, and sufficient mitigation of the threat uh, that this was the right thing to do, that the threat was not, uh, that it did not, that the transfer of these detainees did not pose uh, a significant threat to the United States. There's enough mitigation for how long, though? Uh, enough mitigation. I don't have the details of uh, the circumstances of uh, how uh, the cutteries will uh, follow the detainees and monitor the detainees uh, and uh, all the aspects, obviously, of uh, the interaction that we have with the cutteries around this matter. But it is the determination of the Secretary of Defense and the national security team that that threat is mitigated. Can you say yes or no? Does it extend beyond that? Again, year? I just don't have more details to provide to you. Okay, and I ha just have one uh, on the EPA. Um, the EPA said the regulation that they announced today would create jobs. Can you characterize how many jobs specifically will be created? What types of jobs? Do you have a benchmark that you're looking at? It's our view that this uh, proposed rule, when implemented uh, over time, would create tens of thousands of jobs. Uh, the opportunities for job creation are apparent certainly in uh, areas of renewable energy. Uh, we've seen that already in uh, solar energy, wind energy, uh, biofuels, uh, and that growth has con occurred already in the past several years. The, the growth in renewables has, uh, and renewable production has contributed to the reductions we've already seen in carbon emissions. We've also seen a significant expansion of, uh, it, consistent with the President's all of the above approach to energy production that we've seen a significant expansion in our natural, uh, natural gas uh, production here in the United States. And as you know, natural gas burns uh, twice as cleanly as, for example, coal and other fossil fuels. And what do you say to your opponents who say ultimately it's going to cost jobs um, in the gas and coal industry? Look, I think that <laughs> it's worth noting, and I'll, I'll, I don't know if I have anybody from the National Journal here, but I'm going to quote the National Journal, uh, who, which reported last year, quote, in fact, coal mining jobs in Appalachia fared far worse under the Reagan, Clinton, and George H.W. Bush administrations uh, than they have under President Obama. And you know, we have taken steps uh, to approach our energy needs and our energy security in an all-of-the-above fashion, and that includes uh, increasing domestic production across the board. It includes uh, aggressively investing in renewable energy. Uh, it includes uh, uh, taking advantage of our natural gas uh, deposits in a way that uh, enhances U.S. national uh, security and energy independence, uh, and we're going to continue that approach. And again, I, I would point you to all the history in, in this country of actions taken by administrations of both parties to uh, improve the quality of our air and the quality of our water, and every time such actions have been taken, industry has, um, you know, said that doom is upon us and jobs will be uh, eliminated and the economy will crater. And uh, when these kinds of actions are done uh, wisely, consistent with the science, uh, the opposite has been true. Jay? Wendell. A couple subjects. Was the White House aware when it invited uh, Sergeant Bergdahl's parents here Friday of his father's apparent Twitter communication with uh, a man described as the, the spokesman for the Taliban, commitment to free all of the prisoners in Guantanamo, for example? 
I, I don't know the answer to that. The fact is they are the parents of Sergeant Bergdahl. Their son was held in captivity for five years. And uh, it was absolutely the right thing to do for the Commander-in-Chief, for this administration, to take action to secure his release, the last prisoner of war from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. I'm not asking about that. I'm asking about the decision to invite them here. There are a lot of people who feel that some of the communication he had with this guy was uh, improper. Well, I, I don't know uh, about those communications or what a lot of people feel. The President believes we ought to close uh, Gitmo. Uh, so does senior national security, mem senior members of the national security team of President George W. Bush, including President George W. Bush. Uh, we believe we ought to uh, close Guantanamo Bay because uh, the costs are excessive, the harm to our national security is real, and we I continue to take commitment steps. was to free the inmates. Well, and get that's them. not our position, Wendell, but you can, I mean, uh, whether or not that's, uh, whoever holds that position it doesn't, it doesn't pertain to this issue. The fact is Sergeant Bergdahl was held captive by an enemy force in an armed conflict with the United States and consistent with past practice in this country uh, and an ethos adhered to by our military, we brought him home, or we're bringing him home. Different subject. On the VA, uh, Secretary Shinseki uh, is, gout, is out. What's the next step? Is, is this up to, to uh, Sloan Gibson? Is President awaiting more reports? Has he, for example, gotten the, uh, the report from Rob Neighbors? What's the next step now in, in fixing the problem with Veterans Administration? Well, when it comes to the uh, Secretary of the Veterans Affairs, it is a top priority uh, to find a successor. And I can't predict an exact timeline right now, but uh, we're going to look diligently for a new VA secretary. Uh, and we hope to confirm that successor and fill that post as soon as possible. The fact is, uh, and we discussed this last week, Sloan Gibson, as the acting secretary, has uh, uh, a significant uh, background to take on this effort and to fill uh, an important role as we search for a new secretary, and we look forward to that. When it comes to the uh, reviews that are underway, uh, they continue, both Rob Neighbors' review and the, the one initiated by Secretary Shinseki, uh, for which the initial report was provided to the President last week. Uh, and of course, there is an independent Inspector General investigation that's ongoing. Does Sloan Gibson start the process, or do you wait till you get uh, a secretary confirmed that is to, to look big picture at how you're going to fix this problem. Oh, the process began uh, prior to Secretary Shinseki uh, offering his resignation. Uh, he himself took steps uh, aimed at accountability. Uh, once it became apparent uh, how uh, systemic the problem was uh, when it came regarding uh, falsified reports uh, on wait times uh, or uh, misrepresentation of wait times, and. Rob Neighbors began a, a broader review of VA operations and VHA operations uh, that is ongoing, and he will have uh, a full report uh, this month uh, for the President and the uh, leadership at VA. Mara. I have a question about this conference call that the President is doing in mm -hmm. five minutes. Which I know you don't want to miss, so yeah. give me a shout when um, it's time. I think they moved it up to 150, actually, but in any event. Um, why is he choosing the lung association in order to kind of talk, put this in the context of a health issue as opposed to an environmental issue? Is it because he thinks more people would understand it that way? It's I'm just curious why he's chosen that, that approach. Well, because it's both, Mara. It's, and he's talked about and will continue to talk about the broader uh, issues of uh, the challenge posed by climate change and global warming. Uh, but when it comes to carbon emissions, which uh, are not regulated, uh, they do direct harm to our public health. And uh, you can see the instances of uh, asthma and the uh, huge increase that we've seen uh, in this country uh, when it comes to asthma attacks, especially among children. Uh, you know, we, we, we've taken steps to cut emissions of lead and mercury and arsenic, uh, uh, and uh, this is consistent with those efforts and consistent with the public health objectives of those efforts. So that's what the President will be highlighting uh, today in his conference call.
Are you worried at all about the adverse effect politically to Democrats who are running in coal states in November? The President thinks this is the right thing to do, and uh, it is consistent with the actions that have been taken to uh, reduce pollution uh, caused by lead or mercury, caused by arsenic, uh, and the health, the positive health effects uh, are clear. I think that is independently established, and the long-term benefits when it comes to reduce electricity bills and uh, increase job creation are clear. So uh, this is, again, the President's, in the President's view, the right thing to do, and he's confident that uh, there will be uh, significant benefits uh, to our um, health, public health, and to our economy uh, as the years pass. You asked about your future? Uh, Mark, and Jay, Jay, is there a policy that bars U.S. negotiating with terrorist groups? Uh, Mark, I, uh, on the issue of negotiating with terrorists, I would point you that we are in an armed conflict with the Taliban in Afghanistan. Uh, they are not, uh, they are, you know, we don't get to choose our enemies when we go to war. The Taliban held Sergeant Bergdahl, and we successfully recovered him, consistent with uh, past practice and consistent with an ethos that says we, the United States of America, the U.S. military does not, do not leave uh, our men and women in uniform behind when they're held captive. Uh, and that's, uh, and, and it was consistent with that principle that we have pursued for years, uh, Sergeant Bergdahl's recovery. Does the U.S. still regard the Taliban as a terrorist group? We regard the Taliban as an enemy combatant uh, in a conflict that has been going on uh, in which the United States has been involved for more than a decade. And in this case, uh, although, as you know, we dealt with the Qataris uh, in order to secure his release, uh, it was absolutely the right thing to do uh, because he was uh, a, a uniformed member of the U.S. military who was in captivity as a prisoner, not as a hostage. Uh, and so we uh, sought his recovery and, and succeeded in recovering him. So the negotiation to obtain Sergeant Bergdahl's release um, is not a, a breach of that policy of not negotiating with terrorists. It is, uh, it is absolutely consistent with uh, decades, uh, and I uh, venture centuries, because uh, we've had uh, m more than two now uh, in the United States, of uh, past practice when it comes to uh, prisoners of war and exchanges of prisoners. I think uh, if, if people want me to end in time for this conference call, just shout. Um, Connie, you have one? Would you consider becoming an ambassador to Russia? And what do you I was asked this, Connie, and uh, nobody's offering that job, and I'm not uh, headed to Russia. What's Thanks, next Jay. for you? Jay, Jay, you've given us very little detail about this deal. Can you at least assure the American people that the Taliban that are going back, uh, going over to Qatar, will not be involved in Taliban activities two or three years from now, that they'll not be right back doing what they had done previously? Keith, what I can tell you, uh, Keith, is what I've said already, is that the Secretary of Defense, uh, in consultation and coordination with the full national security team, uh, made the conclusion that the mitigation efforts were sufficient when it came to uh, our, uh, the assurances we received from the Qataris and the communications we've had with them, uh, that these five detainees uh, do not and will not pose a uh, significant threat to the United States, and it was in the national security interest of the United States to secure uh, Sergeant Bergdahl's release. I've heard that, but you can't say that they'll be back with the Taliban in a couple years. You can't say that that won't happen. I, you you know, can't tell I, us I don't predict the future, Keith, and I, well, that's, well you that's probably do as that's a, a pretty on your website, but, the, uh, uh, but what uh, I can point. tell you is consistent with past practice. Uh, okay. We have uh, received uh, assurances and are confident that there is sufficient Perfect. mitigation. One more quick one. Uh, the, uh, you've, you're sort of setting this up as kind of a routine, or maybe not routine, but within the tradition of prisoner of war exchanges. The people that you're exchanging are alleged mass murderers and abettors of terrorism, proven abettors of terrorism against the United States. Can you de uh, describe a previous time when people of that caliber have been exchanged for a prisoner during time of war? What I can tell you is that there's, there have been prisoner exchanges in our past. There have been prisoner exchanges uh, uh, consistent with this action by our allies and, and by the United States uh, in conflicts. Uh, where there was a great deal of loss of life on both sides. Have we sent alleged mass murders of civilians back, you know uh, what, Shiite civilians? Keith, all I can tell you is Sergeant Bergdahl is an American. 
member of the military who was held captive by our enemies for five years. And it is absolutely the right thing to do, consistent with U.S. history, consistent with an ethos that was uh, identified by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, that we secure his release in the way that we did. And it was the right thing to do. Thank you all very much.